If you like listening to Warriors in Their Own Words, check out our other show, the Medal of Honor podcast. The link is in the show description. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Warriors in Their Own Words. In partnership with The Honor Project, we've brought this podcast back at a time when our nation needs these stories more than ever. Warriors in Their Own Words is our attempt to present an unvarnished, unsanitized truth of what we have asked of those who defend this nation. Thank you for listening, and by doing so, honoring those who have served. Today, we'll hear from Colonel Robert E. Stofi. Stofi served in Vietnam as a helicopter pilot and forward air controller in the Marines. It was his job to support ground troops by directing fire and performing evacuations. Well, I uh, was in the uh, engineering field and was drafted into the military, went through the uh, naval flight training in Pensacola, Florida, and then had my options there to go Navy pilot or Marine, went Marine. First tour was in Japan flying helicopters. And then that squadron uh, was uh, sent away back to the States. And they uh, transferred me to uh, a squadron, a Marine observation squadron called the VMO-2 on Okinawa. And on that island of Okinawa, we had uh, two types of aircraft in VMO-2. We had uh, HOK helicopters and we had uh, OE-1 bird dogs. And uh, our job or mission was to uh, support the ground units uh, with uh, all supporting arms, such as close air support, attack bombers, naval gunfire, and uh, artillery. So uh, we flew those three uh, different missions uh, out of uh, both environments, the helicopter and the OE-1 bird dog. Everything in the Marine Corps is oriented to support of the riflemen and uh, including air support, naval gunfire, and artillery. And our mission was to perform those tasks of finding the enemy, fixing the enemy, and destroying the enemy with those supporting arms. Since the Marine Corps has its own air arm and uh, its ground units are closely uh, tied to the air support, both fixed-wing aircraft in the Marine Corps Air Wing and the helicopters within the Air Wing, the training on a daily basis is a closely uh, evolutionary uh, situation where daily we use those supporting arms and uh, we're tied in extremely closely with the troops. The difference, I suppose, from the Air Force is they don't do that on a daily basis and therefore they're not as closely knit as the uh, various levels of the Marine Corps uh, fighting forces. Well, in the Marine Corps, uh, in many cases, uh, the pilots themselves are assigned uh, six months or longer periods with the ground units as a ground fact to get the flavor and the feel of what it's like to be with the real true Marine, the, the grunt on the ground, and eat the dust and the, the canned food and so forth. And uh, as a result, uh, when they get back in the air, they have a better understanding of what's happening on the ground, uh, both from professional and from a, uh, a personal feeling of how that Marine is doing on the ground what he really needs uh, from support in the air or the other supporting arms. I think one thing you have to remember in all of this is uh, the forward air controllers and the AOs and the uh, VMOs of the Bronco squadrons basically, as I said earlier, uh, existed only to support the troop. And uh, I don't think any of the pilots and the aerial observers ever forgot that, that we're there to support them in the naval gunfire artillery and the forward air control uh, of uh, attack aircraft. And I think that knowing that that young uh, Marine could rely on very close in uh, bombing drops and uh, very close in particularly machine gun fire, which is the most accurate fire, that they were going to be well protected by their air and could rely on us. And that's probably the greatest satisfaction you could have, that you're not only saving their lives, but you're turning the tide of the battle. And many times the facts in the AOs turned the total tide of the battle from one of total uh, destruction of friendly troops to not only them now being protected, but them counterattacking many times. And uh, these were the satisfying parts of doing that mission. Many, many times the facts saved the day. There's an extremely tight bond between the air 
and and the ground units and a, a real close understanding of of the maneuvering procedures of the ground and uh, this is paramount particularly when uh, the ground units uh, get close in uh, fighting quarters with the enemy uh, the marine in the air has to understand that close proximity and the dangers that uh, are posed by uh, bringing supporting arms, whether it be naval gunfire, artillery, or close air support within close proximity of those troops. Well, in the first tour, it was primarily uh, flying helicopters, uh, and uh, we had a lot of small arms, and we had 50 caliber machine guns, but we didn't encounter AAA until the North Vietnamese got down there. And actually, uh, North Vietnamese started coming in slowly in late 1965, where the, they were the first time uh, up in the I Corps area around the Da Nang tactical area of responsibility that uh, the Marines were in that we were exposed to North Vietnamese and, and they were still in uh, small numbers. But however, when I returned in 69, uh, they had fielded full military units and uh, they brought with them AAA guns as well as uh, the 50 caliber size weaponry. And so there was a, a lot more capability that the North Vietnamese uh, were firing up with. AAA uh, could blow it up entirely up in pieces in one hit. And uh, so uh, AAA is not the environment you want to operate in. And if you can avoid it, you will. And there are, there are some tactics that we developed later on uh, as the war progressed and then uh, after the war for uh, uh, high threat environments, uh, the Soviet style uh, equipage uh, of weaponry that they had to uh, protect uh, their areas. An example uh, of the increased firepower is I was up on a trip to Laos one time up near the uh, Laotian border on a uh, just a reconnaissance mission and returning. I was coming down through a, a valley and I was fairly low because I felt I was pretty far away from any large concentrated troops in North Vietnamese when all of a sudden an Air Force 01 crossed my path out in front, maybe about maybe a mile and a half away, and it just blew up and went down in pieces. And uh, I immediately made a sharp turn around and orbited the area looking for parachutes or survivors or anything. And I already had a red light, a 30-minute fuel warning light on. And so I couldn't spend too much time. So I quickly called for a relief OV-10 to come out there. And I hung around until he arrived. And when he arrived, why uh, he took over looking for the two possible survivors. There weren't any. We never did find any. And... Uh, it was a AAA site, uh, obviously, uh, no small arms or 50 caliber machine gun. It was just a couple of fast shots and it just blew it right out of the sky. And it could have been me and probably would have been me because I was in the same flight path coming down that valley when this Air Force plane just crossed out in front of me. And I actually went through some of the pieces of the, of the metal. Well, generally, you get over the area on an assigned mission for a specific area, or you could be out covering numerous areas uh, on a daily basis and reporting into various uh, companies and seeing how they're doing. Or you can get airborne and within minutes of being airborne when reporting into the Da Nang uh, DASC, uh, which is the Da Nang uh, Direct Air Support Control Unit that feeds, facts the aircraft, the bombers. Once you get airborne there, you can immediately be assigned a mission if there is contact with the enemy. So our objective was to find the enemy. If we couldn't find them, we would be calling all the ground units to see if they had made any contact with the enemy. And our job was to get there as fast as possible and take control of the situation from the air to ascertain immediately, can we handle it with our onboard ordinance on the OV-10 Bronco, or do we need fixed wing? Uh, fixed wing aircraft were with us at all times. While we were airborne over the battlefield, we had aircraft, uh, both Navy and Marine Corps and uh, Air Force, predominantly Marine Corps, uh, in that area where we worked, and they were with us for two-hour missions up there for them. And uh, we, if we needed them, we'd call them down from 20,000 feet. Generally, they sat around up there and uh, were on uh, alert, ready, uh, itching to come down and waiting for us to find them something to drop bombs on. A typical situation would be uh, when uh, I uh, was flying along with my aerial observer, uh, looking for uh, any problems when all of a sudden a, uh, a company commander called up in panic saying that they were pinned down, the entire company pinned down in a rice paddy uh, near a, a village and uh, there was heavy machine gun fire 
coming at them uh, and they were un, they were unable to maneuver just laying in a, in the water in in the rice paddies uh couldn't maneuver and return fire to this tree line that separated them from a nearby village so i immediately called for some uh, A4 attack aircraft that I had overhead, and they had 250-pound bombs. And uh, I rolled in and uh, made a, a couple of strafing runs while they jockeyed, uh, the, the A4s jockeyed to get into position, the proper attack positions. I rolled in uh, with my M60, four M60 machine guns and strafed the area, then came back and strafed it from a different direction, and then again laid some... Uh, 2.75 inch high explosive rockets in there. When the A4s were now ready, they call me they're ready. Then I brought them in with their 250 pound bombs and then requested the Nang Das to send me another section of a Marine A4s with napalm, which I then ran into napalm from another direction, all right down the tree line. And uh, then came around to check a bomb damage assessment. And when I did, to my, my surprise, <laughs> North Vietnamese trooper stood up in the middle of it with an AK-47 when I came down a little and uh, started shooting at me. And uh, I was just astonished that he was still alive, but he was shooting. So I had to uh, do away with him. And then I came down lower to look it over and there uh, was quite a bit of destruction. So I told the company commander, I think they're uh, okay to go ahead and attack. So they went through and uh, with their plan of getting through the tree line, attacking it and then uh, capturing that area. A lot of things could happen uh, in that OV-10 cockpit with a, an aerial observer, a well-experienced former ground officer who would, was either an artillery officer or infantry officer already uh, with a minimum of six year, uh, months of combat. He's in the back seat. He's capable of being a FAC and naval gunfire controller and artillery controller. And you, the pilot in the front, the same, both of you controlling, uh, capable of controlling all three supporting arms. A typical example would be uh, where we had troops in contact and uh, reinforcements in route to a, a, a rather large village. And the North Vietnamese were pouring in from the Northwest. And uh, they had some boats coming in from the East and uh, they already had control of the village. And uh, so uh, I ran airstrikes from my front seat position as, an, as a FAC right onto the uh, gun positions that were tri uh, not triple A, but they were a 50 caliber machine gun emplacements and they were manned and shooting. Uh, I ran bombs on that with uh, Air Force 1000 pound bombs uh, as the uh, aerial observer in the back seat was setting up an artillery unit to fire on the Northwest upon the North Vietnamese that were coming from the Northwest. And then right after that, when he had, the, had established that, then he switched right over to naval gunfire and fired some naval gunfire rounds to the east upon the ships, or not ships, but uh, uh, boats that were in the uh, river. Once we decided on how we were going to handle the precarious mission at hand, the aerial observer and a pilot discussed who was going to handle what, so there'd be no conflict and who was going to handle what radios. Uh, an example in case was if the pilot was running uh, attack air bombers on, he would be on a UHF radio and he would be talking to the ground on the FM radio. So he could be, uh, the ground troops had only FM. So uh, that specific combination of dialogue would take place. The aerial observer in the back seat would be on HF speaking to the naval gunfire, but he also had to come up on the same frequency as the pilot in the front seat as far as talking to the troops go on FM. So you had to be a little cautious on who was talking when and try to keep it all going at the same time if you had all three supporting arms bearing uh, upon the enemy who was fleeing in sometimes or were just moving into the area. And uh, you had a very fast situation going. And uh, plus, you had to be very careful that you didn't get attack bombers shot down either. So you were in position to observe how much flack they were getting so you could warn them or even pull them out of there temporarily until you neutralized the area, maybe with naval gunfire. So it was a, a quite a exciting period of maybe it could go from 30 minutes to two hours of very steady uh, excitement between the, the pilot and the aerial observer controlling all three supporting arms. One of the most dangerous things would be that 
since you didn't want to bring your attack air always in on the same heading so that North Vietnamese gunners wouldn't know time after time, here they come again, I'll easily hit them. You wanted to bring them in from different directions. You had to be very cautious and aware of which way you just told them of what heading they should come in to drop their bombs so you wouldn't be in their way. So you could work inside in a close arc closer to the ground and still stay out of their way so you wouldn't have a mid-air collision or uh, even have a bomb drop on you. Once we had them oriented where the target area was and so forth, by uh, we and the Broncos dropping flares, popping flares, uh, and lighting up the target area. Once we were assured that they really understood where they were uh, in re relevance to the era, target area and what altitudes of the target was and so forth, then we would require the fast mover or jets to turn their lights off. And we had our lights off. And that type of environment is extremely treacherous. And in addition to that, as the fighter bombers came in through the attack run, they would get low enough to get temporarily blinded by the flares. And then they would pull off into blackness and try to regain their night vision. So likewise, we in the Bronco would be in and out of losses of night vision. One of the tricks of the trade there was to close one eye when you're near the flare, so that when you pulled out of the flare area and it was pitch blackness, as you climb back up to make another marking rocket or shooting a high explosive rocket down on the enemy, you would then open the good eye that didn't lose the night vision and be able to see what you're doing temporarily until you're reoriented. What would happen was uh, we would have these air on station or we would go back to Da Nang uh, DASC, which is the direct air support control unit, ask for more aircraft. And we would also ask them for specific ordnance line up to match the target. Uh, so we didn't always get that because we had to take what the aircraft were ready and armed with at times. And sometimes it didn't match it exactly and presented us a problem. But we would go out, find a target. And uh, many times, if it was a fleeing type target, because of our heavy ordnance on our Marine OV-10s, why we were able to uh, decimate a good portion of it with the ordnance we had on board. But if it was a large continual target, why then we would have to bring the bombers in. And so as the aircraft would report to us, having been directed to where we are on a, a TACAN or a, a radio vector to us, then they would find us. And uh, we had painted our wings white from the rest of the fuselage, which was green, because we were predominantly over jungles, and uh, the uh, Air Force and uh, Marine uh, aircraft pilots uh, couldn't see us against the jungle. So to assure added safety, we had the wings painted white so they could see us flying around over the, the, the dark green jungles. Uh, when they reported in, we would ask the pilots in the, the, the lead pilot of a two or four plane division of aircraft, what their ordinance is, how much time do they have on station, which was very precarious to know because sometimes they were coming in from Thailand, maybe sometimes they were coming in from just 20 miles away from Da Nang, so you could work them a longer time. So when they arrived on station, you would find out what type of ordinance they had so you could set them up for the proper attack, attack scenario you wanted to, them to perform. Knowing the fuel, as I mentioned, was very important, and uh, then you could uh, exercise them, or you can at times even give them a break while they uh, uh, orbit the area, and you could bring somebody else in who had lesser amount of fuel. Bring them in and relieve them, and then bring these guys back down if they had another half hour on station. A typical scenario would be uh, the FAC is on station with an OV-10 Bronco. He now has found out what the target is, uh, very specifically decided how he wants to handle the target. In this case, he's going to use close air support. Two uh, Marine F-4s arrive on station, uh, and uh, they report their vicinity of the uh, aerial observer and the FAC in the uh, OV-10. The OV-10 uh, request the pilot, a lead pilot, uh, what's the uh, type of ordinance he has, how much time he has on station, and said, are you ready to copy mission? The pilot says, Roger, uh, the pilot in the fighter bomber uh, responds by saying, uh, Roger, uh, send your mission. And uh, you, the uh, FAC then tells him uh, very specifically what heading he wants him to come in and uh, how many bombs per run he wants him after he has given him a full description of the of the target the and then the pilot 
uh, of the attack bomber has to come back and repeat it exactly. Uh, and so it's confirmed. And particular to heading, if there are friendly troops in the area, is of paramount importance. So no uh, fragmentation uh, from the bombs exploding uh, hits any friendly troops or villages and so forth. But once the pilot uh, in the attack bomber has acknowledged that, then uh, uh, he is then told uh, report uh, to the FAC rolling in. And that means that he's at his desired altitude with his playmate or uh, his wingman for his role in to attack the target, at which time he calls as an individual rolling in and the wingman of that attack bomber is given usually a about a count of five to seven or so to roll in next. And uh, so he had, there's a little separation between the attacking bombers. The attack bo- uh, fighter bomber now is en route down to the target. The aerial observer has to maneuver into position. The team of the aerial observer and the pilot in the OV-10 Bronco have to rapidly move into position so they can visually sight the attack lineup of the pilot coming in with the bombs and confirm in his own mind that he's in the right alignment of whatever degrees heading, if it was a 360 degree heading given by the FAC to the attack bomber or if it were a, a, a 270 heading, he, is, that you need that confirmed. Once visually confirmed that he's on the right attack route in, then uh, the FAC will give him a command a cleared hot, at which time the attacking pilot will say, Roger, cleared hot. And at that time, he throws his switches, bomb switches, into the arm position or ready-to-drop position and continues on. And then he'll say, two away, if it's two bombs dropped. And the FAC will respond, roger that, two away, looking for him. And then when he sees the impacts, he'll say, roger, got two hits. And uh, dash two, are you ready? And dash two says, I'm rolling in hot. And then he'll go to dash two, the number two air attacking aircraft. And uh, he'll tell him, did you see those hits? And he's whistling down at several hundred miles an hour now, so he's ready to drop. And you, once you confirm he saw those hits, then you say, from those hits, hit 30 meters at 6 o'clock or 20 meters at 4 o'clock from those hits. And he'll acknowledge that. The attacking pilot will respond by acknowledge where he was supposed to strike now. And then he says, two away, if he's released his bombs. And if he doesn't, sometimes the bombs are hung up and the, the fact will tell him, he'll say you didn't drop any. And then he has to check his switchology. And sometimes in the heat of a battle, if this has been going on for 20 minutes and there's a lot of firepower going around up and down from ground to earth and from above down, uh, believe it or not, sometimes uh, somebody might roll in the first time without having their switches on. And it's happened. With the busy fall season already in swing, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Level up with Gourmet Plus options, prepared to perfection by chefs and ready-to-eat in record time. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. Looking for calorie-conscious options? Try delicious, dietitian approved calorie-smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving. Need an extra boost to support your wellness goals and feel your best as you tackle a busy autumn? Try Protein Plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. With Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice. We offset 100% of our delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for our production sites and offices, and feature sustainably sourced seafood in our meals. This September, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash warriors50 and use code warriors50 to get 50% off. That's code warriors50 at factormeals.com slash warriors50 to get 50% off. Wait, are you gaming on a Chromebook? Yep. 
It's got a high-res 120 hertz display, plus this killer RGB keyboard. And I can access thousands of games anytime, anywhere. Stop playing. What? Get out of here. Huh? Yeah, I want you to stop playing and get out of here so I can game on that Chromebook. Got it. Go ahead, break it down real Discover the ultimate cloud gaming machine, a new kind of Chromebook. The most exciting part for the fact is to see if the enemy is being hit. And so uh, you catch yourself sometimes erroneously, precariously getting a little too close in. And uh, then you start receiving more enemy fire, A or B. You may get too close in to, to the attack route of the uh, attack bomber. So you got to watch that because you get so gravitated to the situation and fixed into what the, the actual aerial circus is that's taken place that you can get in a lot of trouble yourself. Some of the most common losses, uh, unfortunate losses of the OV-10 Bronco were caused by weather uh, due to the, the areas where we were operating uh, in the Da Nang area. As you head west from Da Nang, it's all mountains, and then it leads into Laos, and they're very, very... Uh, high rolling mountains, but with a lot of valleys. Sometime a lot of our action took place in the valleys during rainy season and cloudy skies. And uh, several of our planes were lost by flying into boxed canyons. In other words, you were boxed in. You, you got in there, ran a couple of missions there and uh, found yourself, you couldn't get out. Or you turned and when you turned, you went into a cloud bank and impacted upon a mountain. So some of the losses sustained by the OV-10s were weather-related, just as some of the uh, helicopter losses were weather-related. Only during the, uh, the monsoon seasons, when you really had torrential rains in that, one of the major concerns was being boxed in. The other concerns was getting too low in ravines and that, and having yourself boxed in instead of by canyons, but boxed in by firepower, by 50-caliber machine guns on both sides of a mountain, shooting at you and uh, not knowing should you continue or try to dive lower into small arms fire or try to accelerate as much as you can and climb, but then you're really slow if you go too too steep of a climb. So the canyons were always a, a real serious problem. But again, on the other hand, if you had streams of North Vietnamese troops in those canyons, that was advantageous to you because they were trapped too, because they had no place to go except up the side of the hill, which you could attack them there. So on occasion, I trapped large numbers of them in canyons, some that I found myself and others that I, uh, we had deep reconnaissance people counting numbers of people from hillsides nearby. And some of them, in fact, in conjunction with other arm, uh, army, U.S. Army recon people that were on other hills. And when you put all the information together, you found them. One of the most precarious situations that I found myself in was uh, a night flight where a CH-46 helicopter was shot down about two o'clock in the morning. And I responded in an OV-10 with an AO and brought some Air Force uh, fighter bombers in, F-4s, and uh, lit up the area with my flares. Uh, didn't need too much light because the flames were still burning from the CH-46. And I started playing cat and mouse with three uh, 50 caliber machine guns that had bracketed the site. And apparently one of them was, or maybe all three shot the CH-46 medevac plane down. And uh, it turned into about a two-hour battle between myself and these three gunners. And I got to the point where by about three in the morning or four in the morning, I was going to get them or I was going to stay with them. And uh, so I was able to get two of them. I never did get the third one. And by then I was low on fuel physically, uh, totally exhausted. And I said, let's go home and we'll get them tomorrow. And uh, working through that night, because it was a very low overcast, about 3,000 foot overcast, it was extremely difficult to bring both the Marine and the Air Force uh, attack bombers in under that cloud coverage. And there were mountains all around. And that became a very dangerous situation. And both of us running with the fighter attack bombers without lights, me and myself without lights. And on one of the pull-offs of a fighter, an Air Force fighter uh, came right up under me. I didn't realize it until he went by. And uh, his air blast or 
airflow from the top of his aircraft just shook me and violently moved me around. And I knew how close the miss was. He just missed me. He didn't know it and I didn't know and he never knew it, but I knew it from the shaking of the aircraft because he lifted me about 10 feet in the air as he went right under me. Then I realized that uh, we better step back and uh, redo this a little bit and uh, maybe a few more flares and uh, kind of started all over, which is what I did. I took them back up. I didn't take them above the overcast because it's extremely dangerous for them to work their way back through the overcast, but I took them out some distance to the east safe area, and uh, then we started all over again. But it was uh, about the closest call I had from a midair anyway. The mission of the THAC uh, and the Aerial Observer and the Marine OV-10 was a very dangerous mission, but because of the danger uh, there's a little excitement, a little acceleration, and a, and a desire to do it and perform it because of the unknown and, and the precariousness of it. On the other hand, knowing that you had a lot of weaponry at your disposal, including the uh, attack bombers at almost any given time, unless the weather was precluding it, it was uh, probably observed by us as being not as dangerous as it really was. Uh, we didn't think it was as dangerous as it was, when in reality, it was extremely dangerous. And, uh, of course, quite frequently, the enemy, after having been bombed many times or attacked by AOV-10s, got to the situation where quite frequently they wouldn't fire at you if you were in air area looking for them until you turned away from them. And then they would really fire at you. So anytime you made a turn, you were probably in a very bad situation as far as the enemy goes, because that's usually when they fired at you. If you were facing them or they knew that you could see them, many times they were reluctant to fire. They'd rather wait you out and hope that you just went on to another area. In a scenario with the, uh, the Marine Division and the force level reconnaissance groups, and they were separate groups that the force recon groups went deeper out into enemy territory as a warning uh, screen to the division. And then the uh, reconnaissance, regular uh, reconnaissance Marines were closer in, but still some way out and very uh, dangerously out in enemy territory. They would be dropped by helicopter and one hill, but go elsewhere then once they got on the ground. Many of the times, I would say that most of the time, their only line of communications with the rest of the world, mean, meaning for them the Marine Corps, was through the facts and the AOs in the OV-10s. Now, we would know where they were supposed to be after the drop the day before. We would know where they are, but we never flew over that area, so we wouldn't uh, accidentally bring any North Vietnamese snooping about looking for them. So we would fly not far from there, but orbit in areas within radio distance, and uh, many's the time when I would call into them and they would respond by whispering. And the first time it happened, I thought, my God, the guy's whispering to me, why? And he'd say, I could touch, I could reach out and touch one of them. They're just walking by us right now. The North Vietnamese infiltrating just went by and here come a few more. I have to whisper to you. And I would tell them, don't even talk if necessary. You know, don't be talking. Uh, but I don't want to, you're the only one I'm talking to, you know, I'm way out here in the middle of nowhere. I need to talk to somebody. And uh, so at that time, uh, it would go on sometimes quite a while where they would be really whispering into the radio and they would have to turn their radio down so the North Vietnamese just passing by wouldn't hear them on the radios. And uh, so one of the major things was communications that the facts performed for the deep reconnaissance. And of course, the other was they knowing that they could call upon us to try to get them out of there if they were found by the enemy. Now, you got to understand that reconnaissance people were not far out there to confront the enemy and fight with the enemy. They're a small force generally of eight people. There's mainly to, to observe and get information back to the division so the division would be prepared for what may be coming their way. As a result, the, uh, as soon as the enemy made contact with the recon units, the mission would be ended. That was the end of their assigned mission and they had to go home. So the uh, if the contact was made, and it was a, a very aggressive contact where there was a lot of uh, close-in machine gun fire and hand grenade distance, then we would be called upon to get them out of there with, with our helicopters. Uh, so we would have to coordinate it as a fact to get the uh, uh, a full activity uh, group of uh, attack helicopters and uh, transport helicopters to get them out. 
a good example of an extract, uh, and I've been on numerous ones as well as all the other facts in that theater of operations, would be on uh, April 23rd in 1969, I went out on a standard routine search and reconnoiter reconnoiter, uh, a mission to look for the enemy when I got a call from the nine desk that a fellow squadron uh, mate was in countering the enemy down in uh, an area about uh, 65 miles southwest of Da Nang. And uh, the enemy there had already surrounded an eight-man Marine reconnaissance unit. So I went down to see uh, what the situation was and checked in with the uh, Cobra pilot who already was involved with the situation. And it turned out that it was uh, my commanding officer who had just checked into the squadron, uh, a Lieutenant Colonel uh, Sandy Morris. And uh, he was in the front seat of a, one of our newly arrived Cobras as a gunner. And at that time, the Cobra in the front seat uh, gunner had access to a grenade launcher. The pilot flying behind him was a fellow by the name of uh, Major uh, Depp Miller. And uh, Depp uh, had access, of course, in the Cobra to the uh, machine guns and rockets on the Cobra. And uh, he had been communicating with the eight-man unit. The eight-man unit had already told uh, Major Miller and uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Morris that uh, they had a lieutenant shot and killed and from the eight-man unit and that uh, two were wounded. So that's when I checked in. However, Major Miller came back to the reconnaissance unit, the sergeant in charge, and said, can you get the body of the lieutenant? And he said, no, he fell off the cliff and fell out in front of a machine gun nest and we can't get him. So Major Miller said, well, go get him. And he said, we can't. So I overheard all this. And uh, just then, Major Miller and uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Morris's plane, which had been out there for some time, having come from another mission, was low on fuel. And they had to leave to and water refuel. So he handed the situation over to me. And so I had already called for attack bombers. The closest ones were well, very close, uh, minutes away, sitting on a hot pad at Da Nang. They were Air Force gunslingers, and they arrived in within minutes. And uh, they unfortunately had 1,000-pound bombs, but uh, the enemy already had surrounded the uh, reconnaissance unit. And as a result, I brought in the bombers on what I thought was the logical area where more North Vietnamese reinforcements would come in and, and had them drop their load of uh, thousand pound bombs in that area. And I had then immediately requested some uh, Marine A-4s with 250 pound bombs and then also some with napalm. And I started working a circular area at the base of this hill to try to cut off the North Vietnamese from more troops getting in to work their way up the side of the hill to where our our, uh, eight man uh, unit was, which included the uh, dead lieutenant and two wounded. And the North Vietnamese kept pressing on closer and closer and uh, so uh, I was uh, shooting as much as close as I could with the uh, uh, 4M60 machine guns I had and bringing more air in as I tried to bring the troops down, down slope to a nearby LZ, which was uh, probably about a half a mile away. The, the troops couldn't see it there in dense jungle, but I could see it from the air. And I knew where the troops were because as soon as I got there, I asked them to shoot a pencil flare up through the triple canopy jungle to f- ascertain where they were. Then I estimated where they were by minutes as they were moving toward the LZ in the direction I told them on the compass heading down toward the LZ. However, about halfway down the slopes through the triple canopy jungle, they uh, came under intense fire from the western side, and I, I just luckily had some A4s with napalm there. And on the west side of the uh, troops, there was a river running down that way, and so I napalmed on the other side of the river so it wouldn't get near our troops uh, as they were trying to get out of the area. In the meantime, I had earlier had asked the uh, sergeant, does he think if I knock out the machine gun nest, do he can get him? He said, I think we can get the body. And so I knocked out the machine gun nest that took me a little while to find it because it was uh, under a big log from a fallen tree. But I, every once in a while, I could see it sparkles. I knocked it out and then uh, a couple of the Marines grabbed the lieutenant and, and, and got him down, a, his body down a slope. And then eventually, after much effort, uh, got him fairly close to the LZ when Major Miller and uh, the skipper in the Cobra returned with two Hueys that they uh, ordered to come with them when they were refueling. 
and uh, simultaneously, the previously requested CH-46 uh, evacuation helicopters that Major Miller had called for before going back to refuel, they arrived on the scene. And ironically, uh, another OV-10 from my squadron arrived on a scene. So we set up a racetrack uh, pattern with the OV-10s. Uh, I was the tactical air coordinator airborne to do the whole uh, scenario there. And uh, so we set up a, uh, a racetrack pattern on the west side with OV-10s shooting guns and rockets. The Hueys, the two Hueys with the Cobras on the right-hand side or east side uh, of our attack strafed and, and rocketed there as uh, the one CH-46 stood way back as a reserve in case the uh, first one going in would be shot down. And the first one went in over the LZ and hovered there, taking a lot of intensive fire. Uh, while the six, uh, five remaining troops carried the two wounded and the one dead and hooked them onto the, uh, a rope ladder. Then after hooking the dead and the two wounded onto the rope ladder, then they climbed the rope ladder and the CH-46 lifted off and headed uh, uh, into a very scary situation, which was uh, as they lifted off, they went off a cliff uh, and they were at 2,000 feet over a valley. And it's a unforgettable scene and a real circus act to see these eight people, uh, wounded and dead and alive, hanging from this rope ladder over 2,000 feet in the air. And uh, in the meantime, we've saturated the area with rockets, guns, and bombs. And then I semi-escorted them back into a safe area, which time they landed. They didn't land the helicopter. They left the rope down first and touched, and the troops got off and so forth. Then they landed and then got in the helicopter, and they went back to Marble Mountain uh, Airfield. I think the extracts, by all means, were the most precarious because the whole objective of our, of our missions were to prevent the death of any fellow Marines. And that's why we were there, by whatever means possible. And in the scenarios of these extracts of the recon people, there was always that chance of losing some. And that was, you know, rather uh, impacting and frightening to know that you might lose some. And many times we got them out. And uh, sometimes, well, we, we didn't get one or two, and it was very disheartening. The enemy's attitude in the Da Nang area, particularly south of Da Nang, anywhere from the 30 miles to 60 miles south and southwest of Da Nang, was uh, one of respect for the fact and fear for the fact because they didn't fear the plane as much or the occupants of the plane, but they knew that they'd be rained upon with bombs if they tangled with us. So many times, even though they were trying to aggressively do something, they would stop it until the OV-10 would leave the area. However, at one period there in the summer of 69, a, in the Quezon Mountains, about 40 miles directly south of Da Nang Airfield, there was a large unit of North Vietnamese that was constantly moving through that area. And so they set up a radio station there. And that radio station had multiple channel frequency capabilities. And on uh, more than one occasion, I would go out and any time I flew around there, the North Vietnamese operator would come up in fairly good uh, fluent English and uh, call me by name. And uh, it was obvious after conversations with him that he, he was going to kill me. Uh, of course, he would advise me that we're going to kill you today and so forth. And uh, But from talking with him, I, would, I had to come to the conclusion that he had been there for quite a while and knew all our squadron units by call signs. So anytime anybody got airborne in the area and we, we, they were, were using our call signs, these people would know about it. So uh, I'm kind of dedicated myself and a, a couple of other fellow pilots in VMO2 are going to get this guy. And ultimately, we did get him, but we had to get him from a ground attack. And uh, we coordinated with our ground units uh, after we knew exactly where he was by tr radio triangulation and that. And we had a small attack force go in on CH-46 helicopters and finally captured the guy. They didn't kill him, but they captured him. And he had all kinds of documents of our daily activities. And he was pretty sharp. He was a real intelligence gatherer. So it got a little personal with the uh, verbal exchanges between he and I and he and other Bronco pilots. An OV-10 pilot or an aerial observer, you know, with Broncos, would have been a really prized catch. And there was a $1,000 reward for any AO or, or uh, FAC 
captured by the North Vietnamese in the uh, the area that we operated on. That was common knowledge. Now, that was put out in a couple of different bulletins and that I'm not sure where the source came from, but it was commonly expressed that we had a thousand dollar value on our head if we were captured or killed. And of course, the rationale is quite simple uh, because of the knowledge. We knew almost every grain of sand. We knew all the routes the North Vietnamese took. We knew every hill, uh, elevation of it, uh, how many boats were on a river. That was one of our daily missions was somebody went out and count, counted the boats by each village so we could see if boats were bringing in uh, weaponry, uh, if they were bringing in food, uh, if they were bringing even logs. At one time, we caught many of them just bringing logs in so they could bring logs from the jungles in to build bunkers closer into the city of Da Nang. So uh, we knew a lot. We obviously knew more than anybody around. And we tried to convey that to at least the brigade level commanders as possible. So when we returned, we always had in our ready room, we had an intelligence officer from the division, a ground officer who picked our brains and we would give him the the latest up to date action out there and what we saw. So that would be sent back to division and then filter down to the fighting units. Pretty uncomfortable uh, feeling for all of us to know we had a bounty on our head. And it made you think a couple times because not sure where you would have wound up if you were shot down and captured. And uh, we had a couple of close calls where uh, people were shot down. Uh, One of my uh, squadron mates, uh, his name was Joe Stone, Captain Stone, was making a low-level run uh, south of Hill 55, about 30 miles south of Da Nang in that vicinity, uh, on a large open in the open ground unit of North Vietnamese that were marching toward uh, the city of Da Nang. And uh, so he made a lot of runs on his own before he brought his attack air in. And in the middle of him running an attack air, bombers on them, he was hit on uh, apparently on one engine first. So he feathered that on the climb up and then the other engine stopped. So both engines stopped. So he ejected, he and the AO, and unfortunately came down right in among the attacking uh, North Vietnamese. But in the confusion, They didn't know what to do, I guess, because they were under bombing attack and they were heading north and this and that. But right in the middle of all that chaos, tent mate of mine in a uh, Huey came by and uh, came in and uh, landed right in the middle of it all. But he couldn't land because of uh, the the ground uh, that was there uh, and so forth, the the terrain features, plus the uh, fact he didn't have much time. He just swooped in and uh, the uh, pilot in the AO jumped on the skids of the Huey and he uh, flew out of there with them and got him out of there. But it was a pretty close situation. But if they'd have captured him, either one, the AO or the uh, FAC, I'm sure they would have gained a lot of intelligence because all the units are known specifically by the, uh, by the uh, crews in the, uh, the FAC and AO status of the Bronco. I think the fear of getting shot down and captured uh, is uh, uh, you know, obvious to any pilot in any war. And uh, it has to cross your mind many times. And you kind of think of what you would do. One of my wrestling matches was always if I was pretty far to the west of Da Nang in those mountains and so forth, if I was really close to Laos, what would I do? Would I try to trek through the mountains uh, and westward and try to make it into Thailand somehow or cross a country of uh, the unknowns? Or should I really try to get back through the lines, the back parts of the infiltrating North Vietnamese troops? And that was a, a constant concern. So I think at the split moments uh, when that might happen, I think you'd have to make a decision while you're even in the air, which way should I really try to get out of here? Should I really try to make it back to the South China Sea or should I make it farther inland uh, and uh, find our way there? The other thing that worried you, of course, is how much interrogation you might undergo. And I guess one of the things would be that you could always claim and consistently claim this is your first flight and you know nothing. And if you hung through it long enough, maybe they'd give up. Those are some of the things that made you to think about uh, as you were flying around with, with spare time, which was often the case, just waiting for something to happen until some moments of sheer panic would erupt down below. I don't know of anybody that uh, was a fact in my units, either before my tour in 69 or after that were, that were captured. I did know of several people that were in helicopters that were captured, but that was in the earlier years of the war and uh, 
uh, ultimately they were freed in the POW exchange. There are two paramount things that were in my mind anyway, if not in all the other facts in AO's minds, and that was if a pilot went down, of course, maximum effort was to get him, or if a helicopter was shot down, there was a twofold attack situation. One is to get the survivors out. The other is to make whomever shot it down pay a, the price with their life. So those two things did occur uh, when I was over there. One was we had a uh, an OV-10 pilot get boxed in the Quaison Mountains, didn't have enough of power to get out after he was making some gunnery runs and, and uh, controlling some bombing runs upon a, a large number of North Vietnamese. And uh, he got boxed in a canyon and didn't have the power to get out and recognize it, so he ha- had to eject. So uh, upon ejection, he and the aerial observer went out uh, through the ejection system and a plane uh, crashed into the side of the mountain. And uh, immediately we all heard his beeper. And for approximately, I think it was about two days, we kept hearing his beeper. And uh, so finally we did find him alive and got him out. The aerial observer we were still looking for and kept hearing his beeper. And uh, after some period of time, we decided we're going to go in with force uh, because the Marine's going to go find this this remaining Marine, one way or the other. So we went in with helicopters and the first wave went in and he got up, shot up so badly that uh, we had to get him back out and reconstitute and decide uh, whether we'd go back in. And, and, and they did go back in and the grunts went in in the helicopter, searched the area and uh, North Vietnamese made him pay a pretty heavy price firing upon him. However, they found a what looked like a shallow grave and they uh, just knocked the dirt off of it and it was the aerial observer still in his ejection seat, which indicated he didn't get what we called a uh, man seat separation from the seat. He didn't separate from it like it was supposed to automatically work. So we had a malfunctioning seat and he went in and bounced off the side of a mountain and the uh, North Vietnamese took his uh, 45 survival pistol and took his beeper and were playing games with us for several days with the beeper. And uh, so that's a very sad situation there. But uh, fortunately, uh, the the fact got out alive, but uh, with some terrible memories, I'm sure, of his survival there and escape. Well, sometimes you do lose friends and it does affect you there and many years later. And in the case of one uh, uh, friend of mine, he had spent a tour with me in 65, 66 in helicopters, not in my squadron, but uh, we uh, were tent mates, we were close friends, and we had flown many years before in the Caribbean during the uh, Cuban crisis and so forth down there off of carriers and what have you. And uh, his loss impacted, uh, unfortunately, in my case, uh, he was shot down flying a CH-46 helicopter about, only about eight to 10 miles away from where I was on a mission. And I heard his voice and I recognized his voice that he was getting shot at and in that he was crashing. And uh, I flew over there in my OV-10 and I saw his CH-46 inverted in a big bomb crater. And the North Vietnamese were assaulting it already, but one of the machine gunners was still alive. Uh, out the crushed, smangled CH-46 was fending them off, shooting him at them and stopping their progress. So I brought some attack air in and and after a, a big battle, actually, of dropping bombs and all over the place and getting a rescue, CH-46 is in there. We did get everybody out. Unfortunately, my friend uh, was killed, uh, and he was not killed from the impact of the aircraft, from what our flight surgeon told us when I returned to base, but he had drowned in the bomb crater that the helicopter was inverted in, and he was still strapped in and had, had drowned. When you saw your friends, uh, uh, unfortunately, there weren't that many uh, right around me that got killed. They were in other squadrons and that. It really impacted on you. And you really, truly did realize that, uh, you know, you may not make it out of here alive. And uh, you got to accept that uh, or not do the job. And that's one thing you could always quit. You could actually quit and turn your wings in if you really wanted to uh, and not fly again. I don't know of anybody who did it. I know of somebody who thought of doing it. And uh, then he changed his mind a little later and uh, then continued on. And he was flying helicopters at the time. But uh, I think the uh, fact of life is that the fact that death is near. And uh, I think you ought to be ready for it.
or uh, you're in the wrong business. And I think firemen uh, feel that way. I think firemen, particularly in large cities where they confront pretty dangerous situations in high-rise buildings. And I think they're well aware that their job could require a loss of life. One of the questions, of course, is management of fear. And I think uh, you constantly think that there is an end for you to get out of there. There will be a time when you'll leave or the war will end. And there are periods of ceasefires that took place and gave you false senses of security, followed by uh, periodic high-tense fights, battles. And uh, so I think you go in and out of that uh, feeling of, Maybe today you won't make it, and uh, maybe you will. And I think every pilot has got to have felt that. He must have felt that way one time or another, that um, he probably will get shot down today and uh, could get killed or captured. And uh, that is always there in the back of your mind. But on the other hand, you have to have the positive attitude that, you know, uh, you're going to get one of them before they get you. So you're out snooping and and pooping, so to speak, and uh, aggressively, so that doesn't happen to you. Well, one of the questions that does arise is you're uh, confronting a, a very aggressive enemy. You know what they're up to. You know where they're going. You know what they want to do. They want to capture South Vietnam and make it all a communist uh, country. You know what you're there for. You know the public uh, is not supporting you. It went on for years. And uh, you know that uh, the interest has waned as far as support goes. But uh, as a, a military man, particularly in uh, my case as a Marine, I don't think you ever wavered from the fact that you were there doing your job. There were times Times that you were so frustrated if you saw the local, the home, not local, but home newspapers and saw the front pages of what was said about what we were doing there and shouldn't be there and so forth, that would cause you to say, uh, you know, uh, this is not for me and I should go home. Uh, but you hung in there uh, knowing that uh, you were doing your job, your assigned job, and that's what you're getting paid to do. And you were fully aware that long-term and overall, you were fending off international communists uh, all over around the world, which were pretty precariously attacking uh, all parts of the civilized world at the time. Most Americans know how restrictive we were operating, and we had many restrictions upon us, including a very stringent rules of engagements initially in the part, uh, initial stages of the war back in 65 and 66. So you have these mixed feelings of frustration, like you didn't accomplish much. On the other hand, you do feel like you did your job. And uh, if others, politically particularly, would have done theirs, the outcome would have been much better and you would feel much better about it. But I think each one who served there, whether he be in the ground, on a boat, on a ship, in the air, I think they all felt that they participated in, in uh, protecting ourselves in the long term. And it eventually turned out that that was the fact. And unfortunately, we didn't save the people we went down to save. That was the South Vietnamese because uh, they lost the country to the north. And as a result, it was proven to the world what they had to endure and still are enduring, uh, although hopefully that'll end uh, eventually here as the uh, communist government changes, hopefully, to a better uh, format for the people. That was Colonel Robert E. Stofey. To learn more about Stofey, check out his book, Fighting to Leave. The link is in the show description. Thanks for listening to Warriors in Their Own Words. If you have any feedback, please email the team at kharbaugh at evergreenpodcast.com. We're always looking to improve the show. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review. Warriors in Their Own Words is a production of Evergreen Podcasts in partnership with The Honor Project. Our producer is Declan Roars. Bridget Coyne is our production director, and Sean Rule Hoffman is our audio engineer. Special thanks to Evergreen executive producers Joan Andrews, Michael DeAloya, and David Moss. I'm Ken Harbaugh, and this is Warriors in Their Own Words. History is complicated. The story of human progress is long, messy, and riddled with controversies big and small. On Conflicted, we dive headfirst into history's most infamous events and contentious figures. We try and untangle the good from the bad, the fact from the fiction, and the monsters from the misunderstood. 
Was Genghis Khan a murderous butcher or a civic pioneer? Did the Allied powers go too far in firebombing the German city of Dresden at the twilight of World War II? And how did the Marquis de Sade acquire such a sinister reputation? And was any of it true? These are just a few of the tough questions we wrestle with and investigate on Conflicted. So if you love history or just enjoy a good story, please join me, your host, Zach Cornwell, for a fascinating new topic each and every month. Conflicted, a history podcast, is available on Spotify, Apple, or wherever else you get your podcasts. I hope to see you soon.